The Journal of the Experimental Analysis Behavior has a long and very strong tradition of publishing book reviews, identifying work in other fields that's conceptually complementary to the approach of behavior analysis. Notable among these is a review by Kostal in 1984 of J.J. Gibson's book, The Ecological Approach to Visual Perception. When I read that review, I was intrigued by the notion that the views of Gibson could be compatible with those of behavior analysts, where the traditions of psychophysics and that of behavioral learning theory had certainly been viewed as quite distinct. I didn't do anything active about it at the time. My want to read pile of, of books is always much uh, larger than the have to read pile of books. But I did, in about 10 years, come across in a used bookstore, a book called Direct Perception by Michaels and Carello. But with only $7 at risk, I bought it. And I was intrigued to find the authors are using many gambits that over the years I had learned to use in trying to make behavior analysis seem reasonable to undergraduates, because many of our assumptions are counter to those of the culture that surrounds us. In addition, I found the Gibsonian approach to be not only compatible with behavior analysis, but rather one could really argue that with only a few minor adjustments of phrasing, that it is behavior analysis as applied to the domain of the sensory guidance of behavior. We have with us today, then, a preeminent researcher scholar of this coordinate tradition. Michael Turvey holds two positions. One is at the Center for the Ecological Study of Perception at the University of Connecticut, the other at the Haskins Laboratories in New Haven. His vita reveals remarkable as well as numerous accomplishments. The American Psychological Association recognized his accomplishments first with an early career award and later with a distinguished scientist lectureship. His home university has given him an award for teaching excellence, which stands uh, very favorably, what we will hear this afternoon. He has received se several fellowships for international study. His list of publications runs 11 pages in a very small font and single space. Uh, his list of invited presentations occupies three more. I'm not going to lumber you with all of those, but I thought a few recent titles might pique your interest. One of them is called Hearing Shape, that is suggesting shapes can be heard. Another, Reading in Two Alphabets. Clearly, he's not confined to a single topic. Another, an argument in the BBS commentaries, process-based functionalism instead of structural functionalism is needed. That sounds as if, indeed, we might be agreeing with him this afternoon. Another, inhibition of naming by rhyming primes. Another, optical flow, not retinal flow, is the basis for wayfinding by foot. Well, we're not going to be lost in the woods. Another, very dear to my heart, for reasons some of you will know, resonance constraints on rhythmic movement. Then again, perceiving walk onable slopes. And finally, one that appeared in JAB itself, our own favorite publication, or for many of us it is, an ecological analysis of knowing by wielding. So, Dr. Turvey's agenda <laughs> for today is a tutorial on non-representational perception. Dr. Turvey. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Well, the gentleman whose uh, thoughts we will be considering today went to high school at New Trier High School in Winnetka, about 20 miles north of this hotel, James Gibson. Now, James Gibson has a rather simple perspective on the charge of psychology. It is essentially to investigate the causal basis of perception and action, to seek the laws and principles that make perceiving, acting, and perhaps all of the remaining cognition, if there's any left, all of the remaining cognition, understandable. The particular laws and principles which he seeks, of course, are laws and principles of complex systems. And my particular tack today will be to consider what it is that we might learn from the investigation of complexity, how we might come to terms with the laws of relevance to our particular enterprises. The complexity in question, of course, is quite dramatic. We need to consider complexity and simplicity, as I will remark, and we need to consider it in terms of perception action systems, of which one, the human kind, is depicted on this particular screen. There are obviously multiple components. 
at the finest grain size that we might be concerned with, the grain size, as it were, of cells, we can see that there are 10 to the 7 receptors. There are 10 to the 14 neurons. There are 10 to the 3 muscles. And there are 10 to the 2 joints. Out of this richness are distilled, of course, all the patterns that we observe. I should remark, as I often do in such gatherings, that there's one other figure of some significance. There are 10 to the 16 bacteria that constitute this perception action system. And in the next century, one suspects that, that latter number will not be trivialized. That will be one we will have to worry about. These are ecosystems in great complexity that we're looking at. What does this word mean? It is like most of the words in science. It is a word we grab out of the air. We pluck it out of natural language. And when, then we ask, what does this word stand for? What is it that this word constitutes? How should it be formally interpreted? It's a word we would like to understand, but it's a word that we don't yet comprehend. It's not unlike previous words in the history of science. It's not unlike the word energy, which we came to grasp formally in the latter part of the last century and in the very earliest part of this century. And it's not unlike the word information that we've almost grasped, but still incompletely. We have it down for communication among artificial systems, but we still don't quite have it right for biological systems. That's one of Gibson's deepest concerns. How should the word information be dealt with correctly for the matters that we are worried about, namely biological perception and action? In concerns with complexity, you can do the following, for example. You can quite readily recognize that the word complexity may be picking out an ontological category. That is, maybe the world, the universe, is composed of stuff that you call simple systems and stuff that you call complex systems. Perhaps that's the way it is. And in modern efforts to understand complexity, that is not a bad gambit. That's one way to conceptualize matters, that it is indeed one of ontology. And I'll describe some ontological concerns in a moment. But over here sits, of course, another attitude that we scientists often appreciate. And this other attitude is that, if you will, complexity is in the eye of the beholder. Complexity has a lot to do with whether or not we as scientists have at our disposal the right observables, the right degrees of freedom. As one often remarks in science, you can choose any degrees of freedom that you will, but if you have the wrong ones, you'll be sorry. Getting the right degrees of freedom and the right observables is indeed most of what science is about. For James Gibson, I have to tell you, he simply said, that is psychology. There is nothing else to psychology, he used to say after a few vodka gimlets. Right? There is nothing else to psychology. All that really matters for us as scientists is to discover, uncover, those observables in terms of which the regularities that concern us are capturable. This is the epistemological view, you see. It is the issue of finding what is right, and I'll spend some time on that particular matter. Now, sitting in between, you'll notice this wondrous term that we find in almost every modern textbook in physics, algorithmic compressibility. It's a good term in many respects. It is, of course, a term that members of this group uh, have a deep affinity for. It is trying to find if there is a simple sentence you can write that gives expression to a whole host of data observations. You seek algorithmic compressibility. There are some ultimate examples. E equals mc squared. F equals m alpha. These are ultimate algorithmic compressions. But we must ask whether algorithmic compressibility is part of biological systems as well as something engaged in, sought after, by the scientist. Algorithmic compressibility. Does nature, for example, herself, does a perception action system in particular, as it were, condense out patterns that are themselves governed by very simple yet elegant principles? Let me turn my attention to the composition argument. Because there are a few ways in which we can think about the physics of complexity. And here's one way. This is due to the physicist Arthur Ibrell, who spent his entire life trying to, as it were, build a physics that befits the complexity of biology. And for Arthur Ibrell, you can see here that there is a continuum. Simple systems are defined by systems where there is no time delay 
of energy on the interior. A system that's terribly, terribly complex, like yourselves, is a system where there is a long time delay of the energy transactions on the interior. If we take that quantity relative to the energy dissipated in ordinary behavior, then says Ibrill, then says Yates and other like-minded physicists, then you can begin to imagine that there is indeed a metric of complexity. Borrowing a term on your right-hand side from hydrodynamics is the ratio of the bulk to shear viscosity, the energy wrapped up on the degrees of freedom in the interior of the organism relative to the energy that gets dissipated during one's daily activities. By the way, as an aside, I think there are ways of addressing some fundamental arguments in modern reinforcement theory out of the extensions of this idea, but I will not address those today. If we have a compositionally complex system, what might we say about it? Well, typically we say things like this. It has many's, lots of many's. It has many parts, many degrees of freedom, many interactions. It has lots of non-linear, lots of non's, as I say. Right? It's non-linear, it's non-integrable. The kinds of constraints that are operating oftentimes are not captured when we integrate an equation. We do not end up with an appropriate relationship among variables that's fixed. They are non-stationary. And for those of us who study behavior, non-stationarity is a crucial and oftentimes a thwart, a crucial barrier and oftentimes a real thwart to our efforts. It has many languages. These languages are sort of living inside a particular layout of uh, atomisms and continua, atomisms and continua. If we're looking at a complex system, it has minimally, minimally as far as we can tell, two levels, one atomistic and one continuum. And for a system that becomes slightly richer, then these layers cascade. And if you're at a continuum level and you look down, you see atomisms. If you're at a continuum level and you look up, you see atomisms again. All the way, the same particular strategy appears. The languages are low energy catalytic signals. Any complex system seems to have many ways by which it can facilitate its interactions. It has multiple languages of various kinds to be discerned. And it has loose couplings. We often say, you see, look, as I stand before you, the particular behaviors I exhibit are sort of, as it were, sitting on top of a nested set of coupled oscillations of a limit cycle nature. There are some things going on at high speeds, like, for example, the diffusion of oxygen through the tissues of my body. That occurs about every 100 milliseconds. Then there are certain cyc cyclic behaviors going on much more slowly, like the water balance cycle. That takes about every three and a half days to achieve that particular cycle. But these cyclic phenomena sort of constitute a biologically complex system. It gives rise to a branch of thinking which is called homeokinetics, namely that what's really going on is you're balancing processes in time, not balancing a steady state as such. And finally, when we speak about this kind of complexity, we recognize that there are competitions afoot of all sorts. This is an abstract way of capturing major competitions between coherent process and incoherent process. But we can also talk about these competitions in more standard ways between kinetic energy and potential energy. That's a way of thinking about composition, complexity as composition. I'd like to remind you, however, that the problem of complexity is not wrapped up singularly in the notion of, as it were, understanding how it is a thing can be complex. I take it that you, I, you and me, right, our particular local cockroach, our friendly cardinal in the trees, and any particular cat or dog who inhabits your house is complex. But as I watch such creatures, what attracts me to them is not always their complexity, but rather their ability to distill out simplicity. And in some branches of modern science, where complexity is high on the agenda, creeping up right behind is how it is complex things mimic, simulate, simple things. You see, today, I am, as it were, simulating someone standing up. I'm doing rather well, I hope. I can simulate a walker, a thrower, a catcher, a reacher. I do many kinds of simulations daily. The terminology I like borrows again from this rather interesting physicist, Arthur Ibrill. The story is a good one. I like it. 
is a story about a young man who is having his bar mitzvah and he's standing in line and every person who comes up to give him the gift they give him a fountain pen he gets one fountain pen he gets a second fountain pen a third a fourth an nth found fountain pen and when the grand moment comes for this gentleman this young man to stand up and assert his adulthood his manhood he stands up and says proudly to the audience today I am a fountain pen and for Arthur Ibrill, who was in the audience, you see, his furtive mind captures this notion. Yes, today, you see, a biological system can manufacture itself into a fountain pen, into something like it. It can make itself into synchronized pendulous oscillators. It can do many things of this kind. And the challenge then becomes simplicity. How do we get simplicity from complexity? And in the investigations of this question, this is how folks address it. They think about a three-tiered organization where the lowest level is the atomistic level, the upper level are the boundary conditions. This is, if you will, neural structure and the boundary conditions provided by environment and what other constraints of that coarse-grained nature you might be concerned with. And then in the middle sits the thing that most of us try to grab hold of, the collective state or the cooperative state of the system. We can see that the collective or cooperative stages is supported from below by atomistic structures and from above by boundary conditions. Some of those boundary conditions are the stuff of modern cognition. We call it intention, plans, goals. In the investigation of complexity, these constitute two of our hardest issues, the ones that we struggle with, the ones that we would like to have clarity about. These are circular causality. Look, look how it works. You take a layer of atomistic components. They give rise to a collective state, which in turn, remarkably, acts as a higher order constraint on those atomisms. It acts hierarchically to constrain the very pieces out of which it was composed. In modern efforts to understand the startup of life, this is the issue. It's circular causality. How is it? that you can have molecules under dynamics all of a sudden giving rise to particular ordered structures that act then to organize those particular components, those physical components. And over here, we see another general principle that I will take advantage of. It's a principle that processes, again, in any complex system, have time scales. Some things occur slowly relative to other things which are occurring rather fast. In fact, recognizing this distinction that the slow processes enslave, grab hold of, organize, order the faster processes was important to someone like uh, Simon, Herb Simon, one of the few psychologists to have a Nobel Prize. He got it primarily for this idea. He got it for recognizing that you could take complexity and you could decompose. You could recognize that a system is almost nearly decomposable by virtue of the fact that it has processes occurring at slower scales and faster scales. And that distinction is so powerful, argued Herb Simon, that you can indeed focus upon the slow time scale without loss of exactitude, without any great loss of exactitude. And again, I take it the students, like yourselves, of behavior have long recognized very much this particular intuition. But in fact, processes at a slightly slower time scale have, as it were, their own particular reasonable principles that you can then study, investigate. Herb Simon, again, I'm just using him because he's someone that you know of. You see, he would say, it's that fact there that makes the complexity we study studyable. It's why we can indeed study it, why we can lay hold of it and grab it. But let me take you through some prime examples of such matters of getting complexity from simplicity or excuse me, simplicity from complexity. I want to consider how it is that you do something fairly basic, namely, daily, you are able to synchronize body segments. In fact, you're so damn good at this, you can synchronize almost any two body segments you so choose within limits, but you're damn good. I can, for example, rather straightforwardly synchronize the very small finger and my very large head. That's a synchronicity. I can clearly do synchronicities of arms, arms and legs, head and legs, and so on and so forth. How should we understand this particular ability? It's fairly fundamental, is it not? One might suppose, if my name was Rodney Brooks, I might say to you, 
that you might suppose that achieving, for example, synchronicity is probably what took evolution most of the time. Most of evolution is building, as it were, systems that can locomote, and to damn well locomote, you have to have synchronicity. So what's the principles of synchronicity? Where do they come from? Imagine this rather simple experiment, which is now rather famous. In this simple experiment, one is, as you can see, merely synchronizing two hands, like so. I take this exaggerated form. And then you can be synchronizing this way. But it turns out if I synchronize this way and speed up, speed up, speed up, at some point, I'll just be doing this. You can see it here. If I started in antiphase and sped up my movements, then I actually, at some point, like punctuated equilibrium, as we saw earlier today, I go from one coordination to another, and I do it dramatically, swiftly. If I'm here now in in-phase and you slow me down, I do not return to antiphase. There's hysteresis. This particular phenomenon has been thoroughly studied for some decade now. And this is how we do it. Let's look at some of the modeling that one does. What one does is to imagine that what you're looking at is a system behaving as it were on an energy landscape where in-phase is a very deep valley and anti-phase is a more shallow valley. We can capture that energy landscape by a simple Fourier technique that many of us know, of course. Here we're simply summing the first two even terms in the Fourier series, just enough to give us this particular energy landscape. V stands for potential. The system has potential as a function, as it were, of where it lies in this landscape. And my horizontal axis is relative phase. The phase relation, this was in, this is anti, between the two limb segments. Now, in the modern view of how you probe a complex system like this by, first of all, providing, as it were, capturing, as it were, its energy landscape, then you can take the negative of the derivative of this energy landscape to give you a motion equation a motion equation in terms of this collective variable. Look, here is this nervous system. Here it stands before you. It has many, many components involved in simply doing this. Imagine I'm a quadruped running across the Serengeti. Allow me, first of all, to walk, and then allow me to trot. As I keep doing this, at some point as I speed up, I go into the gate that is in phase. There's a huge amount of nervous system here. When I go into that gate, it turns out that I go into that gate if I'm a Thompson's gazelle or I am a rhinoceros. I go into that gate at exactly the same speed once you scale everything to body mass. These are deep principles. And so when I make this shift to, from one organization to another, it turns out perhaps, you see, that this shift is by virtue of principles or laws at the collective level. Not the level of the neurons, not the level of the muscles, not the level of the joints, but the level of some observable that sort of picks off all that complexity, stands in for all that complexity, and maybe as far as nature concerns, is the very level at which she can write her simple algorithmic compression. So here we go. When we take the derivative, then we end up with our equation of motion. That equation of motion is rather interesting. If you take this part, this part here is if you will, it's a statement of the, let's be blunt, not quite right, but blunt. Right? It's a statement of the coupling function. The function sort of, that sort of carries the influence of one limb into the other and vice versa. It's the kind of thing that von Holst, my second most favorite behavioral physiologist, studied many years ago. My first is Nikolai Bernstein. Here at the end of this equation is N, N for noise. Why? Because this collective state, here I am, look. Thompson's gazelle, elephant on the Serengeti, you see? Here I am. I, I hope I actually don't locomote in this style, but here I am. Right? As I'm doing this, it's at this particular collective level, I'm writing this nice algorithmic compression, but it's being supported by an atomistic layer of great immensity. But those processes are going on at a very fast time scale. And they enter into the collective behavior only as perturbations, little ones. Pop, 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 pop. And thus I can treat them as a noise term for simplicity, Gaussian noise, which is what's done here. And then there's an imperfection parameter. I won't show you how that's brought in, but it's not very hard to comprehend. Here's a big limb. You see a very large limb. And here's a little limb. Right. See? Now, 
what I'm doing is combining a little and a large. They have different preferences. They contribute differently by virtue of their size to the collective behavior. If they were identical, if they contributed equally, then the equation would be perfect. But because they contribute unequally, then there's an imperfection. You can do a lot of research here, and there's been about 10 years of such investigations. In this research, I'll summarize one kind of study, one manipulates the imperfection. Imagine big limb with small limb. Imagine the other extreme, two small limbs of identical size. You can manipulate delta omega, the imperfection. Here it is, along this slightly tilted axis, delta omega. And on here, what one is plotting is the particular phase relation at which the two limbs settle. Look, watch my little finger and my big head. There they are, they're synchronizing. My nervous system's doing something quite remarkable. But this synchronization is such that it turns out the little finger is leading by a certain amount the big head. That imperfection is showing up in producing a small lag. And it turns out also that we can play, excuse me, we can play experimentally, although I won't tell you how, with this relationship between these two parameters, B and A. The fit between those two is, is equivalent to the speeding up of a coordination pattern or the slowing down of a coordination pattern. So you can manipulate B over A. You can manipulate it such that it increases with competition, as von Holst would say. Or you can manipulate it such that it decreases with competition. If you want some words to lay hold of, the ratio of B over A is, as it were, a monitor of how much cooperation is going on in the system. Delta omega is a monitor of how much competition is going on in the system. And so this the set of points that are showing up in the green trajectories, black trajectories, on this particular figure. Those sets of points are arising out of different levels of competition and different levels of cooperation. The predicted outlay of these equilibrium points and the obtained outlay are identical. I think, personally, this is one of the best data facts we have in our science. It tells us something quite remarkable. We can actually predict, by means of collective level equations, where the limbs were settled down in equilibrium, even though they involve multiplicities of components at many levels of analysis. Let me take you a step further, because part of what I'd like to do is to show you some of these quantitative procedures. It would seem that my particular movements as I walk around the stage are, this is Bernstein, as similar as minted coins more alike than two drops of water, he said. So as I move like this, as I make myself into a pendulum oscillator, here I go. Or as Arthur Ibra would say, make yourself into a clock. And here I am, you see, I've made myself into a clock. I repeat spatially the extent, and I repeat the actual periodic time. I can do that very well, I can maintain those particular uh, stabilities. Here's what it looks like if I was oscillating a large limb, and here's what it looks like if I'm oscillating a small limb. And these curves that you see here are called plots within a phase plane. On this axis is velocity. On this axis is displacement. And in here, then, you see these orbits. These are simply the orbits of a large limb, or if you will, a small limb. Now you can see there's noise involved. I do not, as it were, ride the same orbit in the phase plane identically every time. The system is inherently less precise than that. Now what we'd like to do, for example, is understand what's behind this particular variation. This is variability. What's behind the variability? How might it be comprehended? In modern science, as some of you, I think, are well aware, you're not allowed to use the word noise anymore. You cannot simply say, this is a noisy process. You must be circumspect. You must prove it. You must prove it's noisy. This is a whole different ball game, right? You must prove it's noisy. You cannot say, oh, my data are noisy. You cannot say the process is noisy. Someone will look at you today and say, prove it. Show me it's noise. And not, for example, determinism. Show me it's noise. Let's go and look at these two. What would I like to know about these two? Well, oddly enough, there are some things I'd like to know. I'll summarize them in these strange terms. I'd like to know how many dimensions I need in order to capture these orbits such that any two particular points in here 
are not near each other simply because I, as an experimenter, took my data and projected it onto this plane. These data may be generated by a system that lives in more dimensions than those in which I've chosen to try to capture it. So I need to find how many dimensions I should embed this process in so that I can guarantee that no two data points are sitting near each other simply because I projected the data into the wrong space. I need to find the number of embedding dimensions. You can see, as we anticipate, more embedding dimensions here than there are, sorry, fewer embedding dimensions are needed here than are needed here. I would also like to know that once I'm inside this appropriate dimension, how many degrees of freedom are actually responsible for the process I'm watching? That is to say, if one was a neuroscientist, you would like to know when I'm producing this movement, exactly how many first order autonomous differential equations do I need? How many degrees of freedom internally do I need? How many control steps, control processes do I need to produce this versus this? We call these active degrees of freedom. It turns out there are three here and four here. It takes fewer to run the large limb than to run the small limb. Try it sometime. You may, in good old introspectionist ways, intuit just that. Let's have a look at how that's calculated. Because I think some of these methods are of relevance to our efforts to make a quantitative study of behavior. My challenge, of course, in trying to understand even this tremendously simple process of oscillating limbs is that I don't know what the right observables are. I don't know what they are. And so what I must do is build fake observables. It turns out I can do this. You'll excuse my bad writing over here. I can build fake observables. There is a major theorem afoot, Tarkin's theorem. And Tarkin's theorem tells us that, in fact, you can take any particular scalar that you happen to measure, and from it, you can reconstitute the particular space of variables that are responsible for producing the system's behavior. You need only one measurable quantity. From it, you can generate the actual dynamics of the system in the large. This is a remarkable theorem. It is one of the main stays of modern nonlinear dynamics. It's one of the major tools we currently use. It follows from the fact that if systems are nonlinear, then they are all interconnected. You give me one measure, and that measure's knitted, knitted together, braided together with all other possible quantities and observables. So what I need to do is to create these fake observables. Here what I do is use a procedure of, is it halfway? Good. Use a procedure of so-called mutual information. What this procedure does is it goes through the time series and essentially discovers the distance between two points in time at which you cannot any longer predict very well one point from the next. So what you're looking for are these kinds of minima, see? Because this allows you to build a particular time-delayed copy of your original datum that is, as it were, orthogonal to your original datum. The move is to build a number of orthogonal dimensions off of the one observable that you can, in fact, measure. And we build these time delay copies. Here you can see x of t, x of t plus tau, x of t plus 2 tau. Build as many as I need. What's my criterion to decide when I've used them all up? I use the procedure, standard procedure of global false neighbors. Look, here are two points in this space of x of t and x of t plus tau. You, for your own purposes, you can imagine any coordinate system. These two points are near each other in this space. Question is, are they really neighbors? Or are they simply false neighbors by virtue of the fact they come from somewhere else and I force them to be neighbors illegally? So as I open up the space, I can begin to see how these two points spread out. And if I use a threshold measure, I can begin to decide for myself when it is I'll accept that any further expansions of this space will no longer separate the points any further. And then I tell myself I must be in the right space at this point. I have enough dimensions to guarantee that no two data points are sitting next to each other simply because of my problem of projecting the data into too small a space. As you can see, the force nearest neighbors, that's this notion here, begin to disappear as the dimensions increase. And at that point, I know, in modern language, I know that I've now captured the dimensions in which the attractor for the system 
The thing that's sort of governing its behavior lives. Let's go into that attractor. And now let's see what it's requi what's required to travel on this attractor, to travel around it, to travel over it. <coughs> and here we use a method of local force neighbors. This particular method now is not uncommon to you. You go to some particular vector and a radius around it, and you look at the points in this region, that vector and its neighbors, and you see how well you can predict the behavior to the next particular time interval that you wish to investigate. Basically what you're doing is you're going onto a surface like this. You're going onto a surface, taking a set of points in a neighborhood, and you're now trying to write, if you will, a simple linear equation, a simple linear equation that will predict where these points will progress to, how they will evolve. So you're sitting on some particular space called the attractor, and you're now looking at it going locally, seeing how well you can predict how the points will evolve in time. And again, you do the same thing. How many dimensions do I need to build up good predictions locally? And this particular strategy gives me what's called the active degrees of freedom. This is how one decides how many particular first order autonomous differential equations, how many right degrees of freedom are sitting behind the phenomenon in question. That's the strategy we use. I can take you a step further with these kinds of strategies. Because I think, again, I think they have some value in the modern efforts to quantify behavior. As I stand before you, just standing upright, I, of course, am not perfectly still, even if that's my terrible intent. If I stand in quiet stance, I'm still in fluctuation. It's the way of the system. There are many parts oscillating. And gravity is willingly grabbing any slight deviation from perfect stance and magnifying it and I have to correct. Let's look at such a system. Here's a person standing. As you can see, center of pressure is a measure of all of the muscular activity that's responsible for keeping you where you are. There's the center of pressure time series, COP against time. Then what one does is the procedure of embedding. Take these data and embed in an appropriate space of the right dimensions. Force nearest neighbors disappear. Same thing. Now, take one of these particular vectors that you've created at a particular point, stick a radius around it. Here's a sphere. Take this sphere now and run this sphere right throughout your data set and ask, does this vector repeat anywhere? Does it recur? Does this vector come back at any point? So as I take this sphere with a particular vector defining it and a radius, I run it through all the data and I keep seeing whether another vector falls into that neighborhood. And then I plot those things. That's a recurrence plot, as you can see. It's a device for discovering structure that's very subtly hidden and coded in your databases. And this particular recurrence procedure has a, a whole variety of nice measures. But look, each of these points that I fill in, imagine me, you see, I go in and say, when I run this sphere through all of the data points and I find a repetition, a recurrence, make a dot. So data like this, which looks terribly messy, turns out to have some recurrence, tends to have some kind of repetitions. And some of these repetitions form strings, as if what the system is doing is, is deterministically moving along. It's in this vector, one next to it, one next to it, one next to it, one next to it, and then pop, disappears. And then all of a sudden you see another vector string, pop, pop, pop. You see determinism, living inside a sea of stochasticity. Determinism inside a sea of what is otherwise uh, obvious rampant variability. If we study a person standing upright with eyes closed and a person standing upright with eyes open and we look at the root mean square variability, not surprising to anyone in this room, standing upright with your eyes closed is more variable than standing upright with your eyes open. But the kicker, I think, is here. The amount of determinism calculated in terms of quantifying, you see, these strings that sit inside a recurrence plot. The amount of determinism is greater when the eyes are closed than when the eyes are open. Are there lessons here for the behavioral scientist? I think there are some profound ones. Being more variable does not mean being more random. Variability and randomness are not the same concepts. Being more variable does not mean being more random. And further, rules of action how might they look? Well, this is just speculation, just a guess. 
Its origins are from this city, Chicago. This is where the folks developed recurrence quantification procedures. Rules of action, what do they look like? Well, who knows, you see. Perhaps they look like rules in the sense of strings of deterministic statement piecewise, a piece of determinism, a piece of determinism, where determinism and stochasticity are braided together. I have no idea what a biological rule for behavior looks like. I have no idea. And sometimes I think, if I'm following Turing, that a rule for behavior looks like a very fancy declarative sentence. But I could be terribly wrong. They may look nothing like that at all. Perhaps piecewise determinism is how nature does some of these things. Let me turn to a little bit of the problem of perception. I wish to consider one particular perception example, and this is dynamic touch because I really need to allow you to sort of retrace some of your steps. Where do we begin this particular presentation? I began by suggesting that one of the ultimate challenges is to understand how it is complex things exhibit simplicity with the possibility that this simplicity is itself revealing of a law of elegant simplicity at the scale of the collective behavior of the system. Now, perception, said James Gibson, is packed with such examples. For James Gibson, the challenge of understanding perception is not, I have to tell you blatantly, is not more brain theory. The challenge for understanding perception is not more computational theory. The challenge for understanding perception is what the hell are the right observables? What are the variables? So here we stand in this room, you see, packed with light. Gibson would say the theory we have to worry about with respect to vision is not how the brain takes all these bits and pieces and magically composes this unitary structure. No, the problem is to get the math and physics right of this distributed energy structure. That's the challenge. And if we don't have the right math and physics right now, that is, if we don't have a math and physics that can capture the specificity in the light right now, then it is not our job to go and make up stories about how the brain is solving a mystery. That's not our job. Our job is to get the math and physics right. It's a different job, said Gibson. Very different job. See, it's very easy. Look, if I say to you, oh, by the way, I've gone and done all this analysis of light and sound, and I have to tell you, I find lots of things going on in a person's head that don't fit the light or sound. So this means the brain must make up the missing pieces. And then I have to get into theories about where the particular ingredients come from that provide the corrective strategies to compensate for what's missing. And Jimmy Gibson would say, and ecological scientists say, this is not the problem. The problem is getting the right degrees of freedom, the right observables. Here's wielding an object in your hand. You lift up a cup and you feel its magnitude, its dimensions. You know a lot about the objects you wield and heft without availability of vision. When you wield something, this is the angular acceleration. These are the torques that you are producing muscularly. This is the inertia tensor. It is a quantity that couples the torques and the angular accelerations. It is a nine item matrix where those nine items capture the differences in resistance to rotational acceleration in different directions. Not unlike the optic array, different intensities in different directions. It has structure. It turns out that this machinery here, this field of meters, like in my muscles, you see, I have all these devices at all kinds of length and time scales in their operation, which are metering the deformation of the skin. They are all atomisms, but this system operates collectively, and it must operate collectively under a Gibsonian analysis to go in and grab that which is invariant over these changing angular accelerations, changing torques, what sits inside the changing pattern of forces that doesn't change. It turns out that this field of meters is tied to the inertia tensor. Ten years or more of research have shown, I think, some delightful results. You can perceive the length and width and weight of a handheld object that you grasp firmly and simply wield it like this. You perceive those as power law functions of the eigenvalues of the inertia tensor. You perceive orientation of the object in your hand, like a tool or a hammer that you happen to be holding. You perceive its orientation, you perceive where your grip is, without aid of vision, by virtue of the detecting of the eigenvectors of the inertia tensor. 
So this inertia tensor, you see, it collapses into three symmetry axes around which its mass distribution is, to repeat, symmetrical. And around these axes are the maximum, minimum, and intermediate resistances to rotation. It's as if this machine, you see, me, goes in and grabs the inertia tensor. That's what's invariant in this structure. And it turns out my perceptions are remarkably scaled to this structure. The inertia tensor, then, is a rather interesting particular device. And uh, more could be said, but I think what I'll do with that more to be said is to take you where we need to go. We need to go to some wrapping up. I could, of course, spend a lot of time on perception, but I chose today to let you see something about how it is that action itself can be investigated. What kinds of quantitative procedures are out there today in the marketplace of modern physics, modern nonlinear dynamics, allowing us to ask certain questions that previously we might not have imagined and whose answers surprise us when we come across them. The ecological approach asks what are the laws and principles at the ecological scale that are formative of the perception and action capabilities of all these biological systems not just humans, right? across all phyla. What makes them capable of doing what they do, of seeing and flying, of smelling and touching? We classically, I think, operate this way. This is the classical approach. I call this, of course, the essential computational, representational approach. This is cognitivism in its finest form. It says, if you wish to understand action, then you must view it, as it were, through the metaphor of, uh, of an agent that's controlling segments of the body. The brain is typically said to issue commands. It's typically said to sort of address the pieces somewhat separately. It addresses this piece and that piece. We typically view the system as high dimensional. If I try to build for you a theory, for example, of distance perception, which by the way, as I always like to point out, you may note that after almost 200 years, we do not have a theory of distance perception. I always take this as telling us something is terribly wrong with our psychology. 200 years. We have not investigated any problem as much as that one. And we still do not have a theory of how you perceive distance. Typically, we view it as a high dimensional problem. All kinds of cues. We seek to identify them, worry about how you fit them together, or calculate something off this piece and use it to verify or rectify a calculation done elsewhere. We look, typically, for non-holonomy, not wholly by law, non-holonomic, not wholly by law. And much of our investigations in modern cognitivism, modern psychology, is to sort of uncover the algorithms, usually written in a declarative language. This is the emphasis upon the language of thought. This is the standard and wondrous interpretation that grew up in this century, that you can treat the nature of mind as a symbol-manipulating system. You can follow Descartes and Thomas Hobbes and, of course, in contemporary era, Turing. And thus you can treat mental states as if they are all, in some sense, reflective of a linguistic, a quasi-linguistic-like structure, declarative sentences. I take this to be most of modern psychology, and I take this to be the ecological perspective. It says, rather than considering these problems as other organized, you must seek a self-organizing answer, better, I should say, you should have a self-organizing strategy. You should approach the problem in terms of self-organization. Don't create self-actional concepts. Don't go looking for singular causes, for singular phenomena. Try to understand how it is that the phenomena in question is itself the essential consequence of the way all these parts fit. It's a self-ordering process. As James Gibson and uh, Nikolai Bernstein remarked this century, their punchline, their push, most phenomena are probably low dimensional. That is, find the right observables, the right degrees of freedom. Once you find them, it turns out these phenomena are not living truly in high dimensional spaces. They're living in low dimensional spaces with laws befitting those low dimensional spaces. The challenge is to find those observables and to recognize the system is low dimensional. Look at the diagram. It says many lines here for controlling the marionette. Marionette, what's the word? Marionette? Puppet but few are here. And finally, to uh, complete, the push is holonomy, holy by law. Look, it's a strategy. It's a way of saying, 
our best bet for understanding behavior, our best bet for understanding perception and action, is go and find the laws. That's our best bet. Anything else has a tinge of arbitrariness to it. We have to go and find the laws. Don't give up on searching for them. Approach the whole problem as if it's a problem in holonomy. What are the laws? And the notion of compiled I bring in here to compare with declarative. Because the notion of compiled is, if you will, the assumption that knowledge can be compiled in energy distributions. James Gibson, high school student, New Trier High School, 20 miles from here, northward. What a great idea, you see. Optical fields compile knowledge. The brain itself is not responsible for making up the world. No, the brain has to resonate to the structure that's here that's specific to the facts of the world. That's a different story. Optical distributions, mechanical energy distributions playing out on the tissues of the body, these have specificity. They are compiled knowledge. That's an interesting idea, I think. At least one that maybe this community could appreciate. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you. I'm much appreciative. Thank you. Thank you.